Hope everyone's enjoying the conference so far. Um, my name is Javi. I'm an iOS engineer uh, until very recently working at, at Twitter uh, here in San Francisco. Before that, I uh, was working on Fabric uh, also at Twitter. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about something completely different. Um, it's a fun side project that I worked on during a weekend. Uh, and I hope that um, you'll find it interesting. It's a small Swift library, um, small Ruby's Cube library, and a genetic solver algorithm. Uh, I'm by no means an expert in any of those topics, except for maybe Ruby's Cubes. Uh, so, you know, this is not going to be extremely scientific, but I wanted to show you how, um, you know, with a little bit of code, uh, hopefully this uh, may be applicable someday in the future when you're solving a problem. Because uh, I, I found it really fascinating uh, what you can do with this. Uh, but first, let's, let me get an overview on um, where this stuff comes from. The theory of evolution by natural selection was put forward by Charles Darwin in 1859 uh, in his book on the origin of species. And uh, this theory is able to explain how a very simple process, natural selection, can create organisms with such complexity, like ourselves. Through random mutations that occur as organisms reproduce, uh, the idea of survival of the fittest and a few billion years we got from single cell organisms like the one on the left to incredibly complex structures like our eyes. I'm not gonna go into full biology class here by any means, but uh, this is basically the steps that this process takes. Uh, we don't know quite how it started, uh, but once we had the chemical ingredients for life, all evolution needed was time. Random mutations occur essentially as errors during the duplication of DNA when organisms reproduce, and uh, that creates variety and change in the genome. With time, some of those mutations will prove advantageous and uh, will allow them to survive at a higher rate. And so they will be able to pass on those mutations to further generations. So why are genetic algorithms so useful in computer science. Um, here's uh, my take on that. A lot of the problems, or most of the problems that we solve on our day to day when making apps are, um, get, are solved really through a combination of uh, divide and conquer and some you know, level of mathematics, you know, basic arithmetics most of the time. Uh, however, there are problems for which we can't really come up with a clear set of steps to solve them. Uh, a Rubik's Cube may be not one of those problems. Uh, there are many uh, methods to solve them. Uh, so I could have taken one of them and just written that method in code, but that would have been no fun. Instead, with a genetic algorithm, we could come up with an algorithm to solve a Rubik's Cube without encoding any of the rules for how to go about actually solving the cube. Here's an example of uh, genetic algorithms. I think this is the coolest thing that I've seen people do with them. By using triangles with random positions, size, and color, this program was able to approximate the Mona Lisa painting. The results are really incredible. It's really accurate. The, on the last slide, there's a link to the full article that uh, talks about this. So before getting uh, into the, the Swift code for the Ruby's Cube case, let's look at a much simpler problem solved using a genetic algorithm so that we can see what uh, this sort of algorithm looks like. We're going to make a program that, given a number that we're going to give it, it's going to try to find that number. Um, now, of course, a genetic algorithm is, is, is really overkill for that. Uh, but I, I picked it because it, it shows, uh, it illustrates very clearly the sets of steps that we need to uh, implement for a generic algorithm. And uh, any other problem is gonna, take, is gonna follow really the same steps. Don't worry if you can follow along all of the code in the slides. Uh, you can uh, look at it offline. And um, there's also a, a Swift playground uh, with all of it. Uh, basically, we're gonna try to find number x uh, in binary. So we're gonna start with a bunch of zeros. And uh, in each generation, we're going to mutate some of those zeros. So they're going to flip to one. And uh, the way that we're going to find out which, which ones are the fittest that are going to survive is simply by looking at how many of those zeros or ones match 
the number that we're looking for. Uh, so we start with a pool of individuals. These individuals uh, represent a number, and they're really a potential solution to our problem. And this right here is perhaps the most important part. We need to be able to calculate the fitness for each individual. What that means is how close we are to the solution to the problem. In this case, uh, we calculate it by how many bits match our solution. Uh, in the case of a Rubik's Cube, we can, uh, we'll see it'll be how close we are to the solved state of the cube. I'm not showing all of the code. There are some helper functions that I'm calling from here, um, like to flip bits and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, but the uh, general idea here is that uh, to create random mutations, uh, we just flip some of the bits, um, in this case, 5% of the time. And uh, here's what's important to realize about these mutations. When I say they're random, they're really random. Uh, and it, this may seem really silly because uh, it's obvious that often they're not going to take us closer to the solution. And uh, what's interesting about that is that in practice, that's actually the case. Not only in uh, generic algorithm, but also in the real world. Uh, the mutations that organisms have when they reproduce, they're often either they don't do anything or uh, they may actually be negative. With all that code, we can put it all together, and this is really the body of the algorithm. Uh, these are the steps that we talked about before. The least fit individuals are less likely to survive, so we remove them from the array. The rest mutate randomly, getting us potentially closer to the solution. And then we sort all of them by fitness, uh, so that we can have the fittest in the front. If we run it, uh, like in this sample output, uh, with a population size of 10,000, so 10,000 potential solutions uh, at any given um, iteration, we found the solution after 12 generations, so after 12 uh, steps of uh, doing random mutations. We can tweak the parameters for the size or the mutation rate, and we'll get slightly different results. And uh, it's actually really fun to modify those parameters and see what uh, you know, different behaviors we get. All right, now to a cooler problem. Now that we know the basics of genetic algorithms, let's try to solve a Rubik's Cube with one of them. I'm sure you've all heard of uh, this puzzle, uh, but some random tidbits. Uh, the Rubik's Cube was invented in 1974 uh, by a Hungarian um, architect, and uh, they've sold over 350 million worldwide since then. This is my personal collection. And uh, this is what a cube looks like inside. The center pieces don't move because they're fixed to six axes around which the faces rotate. And there are two types of pieces that you can see in this picture. There are edges that have two stickers and corners that have three. Despite its apparent simplicity, when you tear it apart, uh, it has 40, 43 quintillion, uh, or however you read that number, potential arrangements. Uh, and really only one of those 43 quintillion is the arrangement where it's solved. If you could try each and every one of those arrangements one at a second, uh, it would take you 100 times the age of the universe to try all of them. And remember, only one of them is the, 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 the solved one. So, you know, it sounds like a really fun fact, uh, but the reason why that's important is that if you say, oh, you know, it's a simple puzzle, let's solve it by um, brute force, right? Even if you could try, you know, much more than one per second with a fast computer, you can realize pretty quickly that it's gonna take more time than we have available uh, to solve it that way. Some people can uh, solve them really quick, though. That's like, 4.74 seconds or something like that. Um, before we can implement the algorithm, we need a way to represent a Rubik's Cube uh, in, in Swift. So like we saw before, we have two types of pieces, so we're gonna represent them separately, the edges and the corners. <clears throat> the edges, uh, and, or in general, all the pieces are gonna be characterized by two things, their position in the cube, but, but also their orientation. Edges have two orientations, uh, the correct one and a flipped one. 
And this is an example of what that looks like. This is a Rubik's cube where every piece is solved except for two edges that are in the right location but flipped. Same for the corners, except in this case, because they face three uh, faces, there are three possible uh, orientations. One where it's correct, rotated clockwise, and rotated counterclockwise. So with this, we can assemble a Rubik's Cube where all the pieces are in the correct location and orientation. And that is the solved state of the cube. And uh, from, from there, we can create an API that given up current state of the cube and a move uh, can figure out where the pieces need to go to apply the move. Uh, everything that we can do on a cube is really rotate one of the faces, either top, bottom, left, right, front, or back, and either clockwise or counterclockwise or two turns, which is two in either direction. Here are three examples of that. Uh, what happens when we move the top face clockwise, counterclockwise, and half a turn, respectively. And lastly, we need to implement this function. Uh, I'm not going to show this code because it's probably the trickiest part of it, uh, although it's, it's open source on GitHub. Um, so if, if you want to look at it in more detail, it would take a few slides. And again, we're going to solve. Uh, we're going to implement this uh, solver algorithm, and the code is going to look a lot like the one that we saw before. We're going to have a pool of individuals, and these individuals are going to be uh, potential solutions to the problem. Our potential solutions are a sequence of moves that, when applied to a cube, hopefully solve the cube or, or take us closer to the solution. And the fitness is going to be determined by how many pieces that solution has managed to put in the correct location and, and orientation. An individual with higher fitness uh, is closer to solving the cube than one with a lower one. And this is the beauty of the genetic algorithm. We just need a way to determine how close we are to the solution. And in this case, that is really trivial to determine. Uh, and we don't need to tell the program what steps it needs to take to solve the cube. Mutating can be done in many different ways here. Um, there's really not one answer. In this slide, uh, I show a very trivial approach. Um, we just create random moves and append them to the solution um, with the hopes that sometimes those moves will take us closer to the solved cube. In my actual implementation, I tried uh, you know, something slightly more sophisticated. Um, you can see on GitHub with some, you know, I came up with that with some trial and error. And, uh, with all those pieces, pun not intended, uh, the solver becomes, again, trivial. We remove the worst solutions, mutate the ones that we have, and sort by fitness. So now the question is, how well does it actually work? <laughs> well, unfortunately, the bad news is that it didn't solve for Rubik's Cube, but I'm still pretty proud of it because it got really close. So I think it was worth it. This is a summarized output uh, in the console of the, uh, one of the runs where I left my computer running for almost 15 hours. Uh, <laughs> the letters represent the syntax that we use to represent moves. Uh, the, the letter means uh, up, down, left, right, front, back. Uh, and what's next to it indicates the direction uh, and magnitude of the turn. The, the first line is the random sequence of moves that it used to scramble the cube at the beginning to, uh, you know, to the starting position that we're trying to solve. And then the last line uh, is the last iteration. After 80,800 um, uh, iterations uh, or generations, it tried close to 500 million uh, different sequences of moves. The solutions are abbreviated. It actually came up with really long um, sequences of moves. Uh, the, the best one was actually 220 moves, which is not efficient by any means. Uh, and the second to last line shows the best fitness that it got to. Uh, the number 16 represents that fitness. So a cube has eight edges and, sorry, 12 edges and eight corners, so that's 20 pieces. Um, um, a fitness of 16 means that it was four pieces shy of solving the cube. And this is what it looks like. 
if you look closely, you'll realize that all the pieces were actually in the correct location, but four of them had the wrong orientation. But that's why it looks so close. Uh, and again, this was done with a program that knew absolutely nothing about what steps or rules to follow to solve a Ruby's cube. And that's what I think is really cool about this. This program created complexity out of very simple steps. These are some useful links to the, the open source code. Um, and my Twitter account is at Javi, so my DMs are also open. Feel free to send me any questions. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>